This is Think It Through with me, April A. Bear. Get ready to start thinking. I know, it's hard, and you'd probably rather not. But here we go anyway. Hello, and welcome to Episode 6. Today we're going to try and get closer to answering the question, what do we mean when we talk about the media? It's a huge topic and a very important one because the media serves the critical purpose of providing us with the information we need to live our lives. But it's also a conduit for misinformation and disinformation, so it's both very necessary and very problematic. I'm kind of excited today because I won't be talking as much as I generally do. Maybe you're excited to hear that too. Anyway, I recently interviewed journalist and professor Jennifer Mitchell, who is one of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to the media, and she's also my colleague, so I can vouch for her credibility in this area. We talked about a wide range of topics, including what qualifies as media, who owns these huge media conglomerates, and why, the difference between hard news, editorialized content, and fake news, the difference between professionally trained journalists and others who are also producing media content like citizen journalists, bloggers, and vloggers and some of the good and not-so-good aspects of those content producers. What kind of ethical standards professional journalists are expected to adhere to? And how can we know who is and isn't living up to those high standards? After the interview, I'll follow up with some closing thoughts. So, without further ado, here's my interview with Professor Jenny Mitchell. Well, thank you for joining me today on my podcast. Before we get into our discussion of the media, I'd just like you to talk a little bit about your background as a journalist and how you eventually became a journalism professor. Right. Thanks for having me on your podcast today. Funny enough, I I never thought I would actually become a journalist. Um, It wasn't my original intent when I went to the University of Southern California. I studied international relations Um, which is, you know, a far cry. I used to actually write policy initiatives for the European Union at the end of my, my work at USC. That's what I was doing. So I was kind of becoming a writer, but I never would have declared myself a journalist. But as the years kind of went on, I decided to go into pursuing my master's in journalism. And so I went to Northwestern and I studied at the Medill School of Journalism which I tell you, it was like, you know, feet to the fire, but it was the best forging, you know, it's like a diamond being formed under pressure and fire. That's what that was. It was the most intensive year of, of you know, work. And <laughs> it was really what sent me on my way to becoming a journalist. And um, promptly after that, I worked in Chicago for a while. I actually worked for the Chicago Daily Herald and the Medill News Service. And so, you know, I got onto the beat of economics. I would cover quarterly earnings and stocks and uh, what was going on with the books, like accounting books of different, you know, corporations that were publicly traded. And I would spend my days at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and, um, you know, it was such a divergence from what I set out to do. I never really thought I'd become like an econ journalist, but to be honest, it's still one of my deep passions. I spend my days reading about, you know, investing and <laughs> trading and all that kind of stuff. And so I think what was the most eye opening about that whole experience was that I was able to, you know, dig in the weeds and with knowledge and information, you become so empowered. And um, in a lot of ways, I think that fueled me into education uh, to become a professor. So when I returned back to Las Vegas, I ended up applying and it was just on a whim to teach part time at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And um, I remember getting a phone call from the director, Ardith Sohn, saying, Jenny Mitchell, will you please consider teaching a class that starts on Monday? 
and I think it was Wednesday. Wow. <laughs> so, and, um, and I remember saying, well, I'm going to have to check because I was working full time at the review journal. And um, I was like, let me check and make sure I'd be all right with my employer. But they were game. And I said, all right. And so I ended up creating a course, an advanced reporting course from scratch in like days. And I show up there day one. I literally remember the first day I showed up to teach. And at the time, I mean, I was pretty young. But I remember standing in the hall with my students. They didn't know it was going to be me teaching that class. And I just remember, you know, they all thought I was one of them. <laughs> and when the door opened, we walked into the classroom and I went to the front of the room and sent my bag down. And literally there was an audible gasp. The entire <laughs> group was like, you're teaching this? And I was like, let's do it. And so it turned into just a phenomenal class. I mean, I had those students crafting like 16 articles. They had to be published three times. <laughs> it was so intensive, which coming from what I just came through, I thought that was normal. Um, what I have found since that time, though, was to pull back a bit and um, especially in, you know, undergraduate education. I mean, it's really like the build. So starting from scratch. And so eventually I found a home at CSN. Amazingly enough, I've been there now for like nine, 10 years. I'm a tenured professor at CSN. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to teach. I've also been part of building the journalism program there. One of my colleagues and I, we really run the shop on curriculum, assessment, accreditation, all of it. And then in addition, I get the joy of running the um, CSN student online newspaper, which is called Coyote Student News. And it's really top drawer journalism. And my students are doing a great job. And we are read around the world. We have a lot of commendations. Um, we're still publishing dozens of pieces every year and getting thousands of new readers. And, you know, it's just been life changing for a lot of my students. And so I find teaching just to be the joy in my heart. It's, it's my way to give back and pay it forward. And every time I get those emails from my students who, like one in particular I just got from Trey Arline, who now is working at the Daily Herald in Chicago, and just my cup runneth over. So that's what's brought me into education, and I plan on you know, sticking in for the long haul. But I still do enjoy the occasional freelance. It depends on what kind of energy and time that I have to give, but I still do quite a bit of freelance writing, editing reporting, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So, Well, you're just the perfect person for me to talk to today Thank because <laughs> our, our episode today is called What Do We Mean When We Talk About the Media? And, mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, you're the perfect person to answer that question. So honestly, I know that when you and I were in undergrad, well, I was probably an undergrad when you were a kid, but anyway... <laughs> I'm not so, too far behind you. <laughs> so when we think about media, we tend to think about it, I think, in the classic sense, you know, like television, newspaper, radio, maybe the internet in its infancy, that kind of thing. But when we think about the media today, what exactly are we talking about? So great question, because the fact is media is any medium that we are using, um, and it's a form of communication. And so it could be simply even a book that's a tangible book, hard copy in your hand. But it also, of course, launches into the world of the internet. So almost anything you're seeing um, or reading on the internet would be considered a form of media. There's also the traditional roots of broadcast, be it television, radio, now adding podcast, which is what you're doing. And then, of course, you get the citizen journalism that we're seeing on websites like YouTube, where you have the vloggers who are creating content. Um, you got bloggers, which is also part of that citizen journalism. But with media, yeah, I mean, it's far and wide. And the truth is we're spending our lives in it. We are deeply engrossed. If you were to ever count the hours that you spend per week in media, I mean, I would say on the low end, it's 40 plus hours. I actually do an assignment with my students who track their usage for a week. Mm -hmm. And I always see, I mean, at bare minimum, 20 hours. And some of them are pushing 100 hours in a week that they're spending using media. So you're talking so about? 
like Facebook and Instagram all of it. Oh yeah. All of those social media. Video games, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, all of it. That's definitely all considered in the media box. So do media conglomerates control much of what we see in here? Oh, I yes. Have, I know you have a strong opinion on that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> do you know, if you look into it, there are really about six huge conglomerations that own the majority of media today. And they're companies like News Corporation, which you're probably familiar with Rupert Murdoch. Right. News Corp reaches approximately half of the world's population every single day. Think about that kind of influence. I mean, it's unreal. Um, there's also like, you know, Viacom and Disney. We're all so familiar with the Disney brand. We grow up with it. But um, the pervasive and ubiquitous nature of its ownership is incredible when you start dissecting it. When you think about media ownership too, it's really fascinating to look at the actual billionaires who own media. So you think about people like Michael Bloomberg. We just saw him, you know, try to run for the Democratic nomination this year as president. Um, obviously, you know, an owner of Bloomberg Media, which is considered, you know, a hugely influential medium. And shockingly, the Bloomberg terminals, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but they have one of the most powerful computer systems in the world, where you as, say, a journalist, I actually had the chance to go into the Bloomberg building in Chicago and work on their terminals for one day. Mostly people that get access to this spend million dollar plus per year in their membership fees. Um, so it's huge news networks and organizations that have access, but you can get any piece of information. Um, the day I was there for fun, I looked up the phone number for for Oprah. It, it wasn't hard to find. I mean, one little search and ding, there it is. <laughs> so the point is um, Bloomberg obviously is a great example of um, a billionaire. You guys are familiar with Jeff Bezos because we all shop on Amazon. You guys know that he bought the Washington Post. When you see this e-commerce giant who, frankly, is becoming a trillionaire now, you have to ask yourself, pose the question, why do these guys, why do these people want to own news outlets, newspapers, radios, channels, um, TV channels, but like why? Because and, the power, I'm assuming, you know, the absolutely. power of the written spoken word. Absolutely. The power of influence, also the power of positioning their products or their companies in a certain light. Um, they can also kind of shoot down certain stories or change the narrative, control the optics, which we all know is so important, especially when it comes to, say, politics. And the media machine is very much a part of that. Yeah, like the Warren Buffetts of the world or even Shel Sheldon Adelson um, bringing it into proximity to Las Vegas, Nevada. He's one of the big tycoons on the Strip. He owns like Venetian and a few other big hotels. But, you know, he took ownership over that Las Vegas Review Journal. And it still becomes the big question of why, like what kind of influence? And, you know, my guess is it's, it's the political GOP um, slant that he's after. <laughs> so when you think about ownership, though, it's very important to be reflective of who owns the media that you're consuming and what is the slant or agenda? How are news topics framed? And then be very aware as a consumer of media. Do you think that that, uh, you know, the control that those people have over it kind of contributes to the public's lack of trust in the media? Um, it's such a nice question. And, and that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that the general public realizes who owns the media or who owns the products they're reading. Um, even, in, you know, if you're picking up the Washington Post. I mean, do you know that Jeff Bezos owns it? Um, if you're picking up the New York Times, do you know that Carlos Slim Helu owns it? Like most people just probably don't even know. And then when you think about where they stand on, say, the political spectrum and maybe what kind of agenda they're pushing on that regard, it takes a pretty educated consumer 
to like really get through the weeds. To your question more pressingly though, the distrust of the media, you know, the concept of like fake news and all media is to be distrusted. Right. <laughs> um, and, the whole you know, other can of worms. <laughs> yes. It is a can of worms and it's really been spurred about even more so in the past four years with Donald Trump. You know, he, he literally by quote calls it wholesale fabrication. So in other words, it's all fabricated unless maybe you're turning into like Fox and Friends. <laughs> um, on occasion, the president gets disenchanted with Fox, but for the most part, we all know that is his preferred network. And also the leadership of Fox will pretty much bend over backwards to do whatever it takes to keep Trump in good graces. Um, so nonetheless, when it comes to the fake news concept, though, and, and the distrust of media, um, that is a very valuable concern. And uh, if you do a little research on this topic, it actually shockingly started in the mid-60s with Senator Barry Goldwater. He was running against Lyndon Johnson for the presidential campaign, and he didn't like how the press was covering him. And so... He, I mean, he did get a lot of criticism, of course, but like so do most presidential candidates. Um, but back then, I mean, he really started it and he started the concept of like the leftist movement or the liberal media. He was really, um, you know, the, the first one that kind of got this like concept spurring. And we're talking, what is that, 26 years ago? No, I'm sorry, 40. Let me do the math. <laughs> 64, 36, 56 years ago. Woo. But when you think of this concept of fake news and liberal media starting back then, and it really kind of is a narrative that's been pushed and particularly by the Republican Party and its candidates um, through the years and its political leadership. And by all means, if you do the research, and I will say it's even kind of hard to identify exactly where does all the media ownership sit on the political spectrum? Some research will point to the fact that there is the large major majority that's owned by Democrats or like liberals. But then there's other studies that you'll read that actually say, oh, not exactly. Most of the major billionaires that own these media outlets or these publications are actually GOP. So, you know, conservatives. So it's kind of an interesting debate. And, and frankly, I think it was used more for the narrative to discredit stuff they just don't like. Right. Um, and don't get me wrong. Yes, there's partisan media. I mean, I could go through the list with you. Um, there's no doubt, you know, sitting to the far right, you got the Glenn Becks and the Sean Hannity's and the Rush Limbaugh's and Breitbart which um, I have very strong opinions. Please never read their stuff. Um, <laughs> I'll be PG in this, but it is like the worst. Um, and even their owner, Andrew Breitbart, um, who passed on, gosh, what was it, five years ago or yeah, something? Like five years. But, um, and Steve Bannon, I mean, the, the, oh my gosh, it's just pure junk journalism. And I highly encourage like educated listeners not to let me, let me ask you something though i mean i think that when you put it out about how the general public doesn't even know who owns the papers mm -hmm. but they also don't understand the difference between you know hard news and uh, editorialized content and as you mm -hmm. say just basic junk you know yes they think well I don't know exactly what they think but i think a lot of uh, the general public believes that if it's, you know, in print or on the internet or, you know, and it's from some kind of publication that it has, good. Yeah. yeah, that it's good or maybe it's all fake, you know, depending on what they think, but they don't understand the difference between somebody's trying to push an agenda and yeah. somebody's just trying to report the news. Yes. And um, to be clear, news reporting that's done with journalistic integrity it is well-balanced reporting. It is objective. You can verify the facts. They're not made up out of thin air. Um, there's very credentialed expert sourcing that is imbued into the piece, be it in direct quotes or paraphrase. There's legitimate statistics brought in from, you know, credible sources. Um, when you think about good journalism, it's actually really clear to see it. Uh, and the sad truth, though, is that 
I think the infotainment, which is, you know, kind of like where they take a morsel of information and then spin it with entertainment um, as the goal, you know, it's, I think, really tainted the field and it's made people believe that everything you hear on, say, a Glenn Beck or Sean Hannity is correct. And that's just not the case, you know, and so facts do exist. And um, I know some people debate that, like whether facts exist, but they do. And also good reporting is, is very clearly done in a, in a certain way with the tenets of journalism. Now, when you have spin or you have editorial, um, most newspapers will actually pay a columnist to write their opinions about, you know, what's going on. And they'll use very they'll use verbiage or language or, you know, cursing or slang or humor, you know, you get the gist, but like there, there's a lot more freedom to kind of just write whatever the heck they want. And there's value in that too. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with reading or enjoying editorialism. No, it as is long just as you to understand what it is. Exactly. Yeah. And then you as an educated consumer of say news, you know, you really should be reading a well-rounded from several sources, I always encourage my students to get outside the U.S. to read international news as well because I think it's a very different look at issues. And, um, and then also just be aware of where products sit in terms of whether they swing very political, you know, and if they are sitting more on the conservative side versus more liberal side, like you should go into it knowing that it's going to be giving you that one perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, that, I don't know, unscrupulous individuals or entities are taking advantage of like uh, the general public's misunderstanding of what, what's news, what's spin, you know, that kind of thing? Well, we got to start with how media makes money. And it makes money, the revenue is made through advertising or sponsorships and um, so when you think about that, like you think about what drives any type of media, it could be your YouTube channel all the way to like mainstream media, like NBC with Letter Holt. But it is in fact ratings that get them higher viewership, which gets them more attractiveness to advertisers to spend the millions of dollars on ads. Um, so we do have to be aware that that influence, you know, to drive up the ratings you know, to give somewhat sensational material or to do it in a way that's keeping people tuned in. Um, you know, that is an aspect of, of media and journalism that's at play. And it, it, it's sometimes very undesirable. And I will say it's ideal not to bridge editorial with the business side. And even in Chicago, I gave like my hats off to the Chicago Tribune that they had actually separate entrances on their building <laughs> um, off of Michigan Ave, where like this entrance is for the editorial, the reporters, um, and you know their editors and publishers, and this entrance is for the advertising, marketing, and business side um, who own the publication and are running it. And they weren't meant to meet; they were meant to be very separate, so that the editorial had its integrity to cover what was newsworthy, what had news values you know, for the citizens and what was needed to be covered in a way that it should be covered and not influenced by the money. But in more recent time, I mean, it's just not the case. I mean, most um, publications, you know, as a reporter, you might be told, no, you can't write that piece or you can't publish it or you shouldn't use those words. Um, sadly, even Murdoch is famous for sending memos in the morning to the reporter saying, you will write this, you won't write this. Um, which is really against, um, you know, <laughs> what journalism is supposed to be. So, so there are so many factors at play, but um, I would say getting ratings up, eyes in, you know, the viewership for broadcasters or readers or clicks on the internet. I mean, it's just, I don't know. So when it, it comes down to it, it's all about making money. It's kind of a hard part because, you know, in journalism, beyond the making of money, it serves such a high calling for a society. And um, all the great, you know, democracies in history, they always had a free press. And you can judge a country by the level of freedom its press has. And keep in mind what the press's role is. It is as an adjudicator to those in power. It is to shine light into dark places. 
It is to uncover things. Um, and it is to hold feet to the fire, especially when it comes to politics. That's why they call it the fourth estate in America. We're the unofficial fourth branch of government. We're, we're meant to be a bit cantankerous with our politicians. Um, so when you get a, a, a politician like Donald Trump, who is really offended by that, he doesn't really understand the role of the press, which is to question his, you know, actions and his authority. So anyways, but the, the high calling of journalism, you know, and it's really, really where the double-edged sword is because you do have to make money to stay in business. And that requires, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a sh you know, certain way of doing business. But you also need to maintain the integrity of elevating the lives of people and informing them so they can make wise decisions in the voting booth this November. We have, you know, important work to be done, but it's complicated. You know, you were talking about um, citizen journalists, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, that's anybody with a laptop and a blog. You know? <laughs> but, yeah. but those people, although they might have the best intentions, a lot of times they don't have the requisite education and background to do real journalism. And I think that might be, as much as I think that those kinds of people are needed, I honestly think that maybe the ethical standards that, you know, actual journalists, editors, publishers are supposed to adhere to, these people may not even know what those things are. You're so absolutely I'm, right. Yeah, if that could be part of the problem, that there are a lot of people out there who don't hold to any journalistic standards because I they know. don't even know what they are. I know. And also, because we're in this social media world where, you know, most people could pick up a camera or start a blog, and there are hundreds of millions of both of those. I mean, get on YouTube. We're all probably on YouTube, um, endless content. And then, of course, with blogging, too. I mean, it's a very viable career for a lot of people. The, the difference between citizen journalism and actual professional journalism is that in the field of journalism, and it's more than a hobby, it's an actual field that has educational degrees. You can actually go all the way up to PhD level in journalism. And there's associations and organizations that support this. There are laws that dictate, you know, how we do business. I mean, even the First Amendment is a good example of, you know, the right to freedom of speech and press. Um, but it's, it's beyond that. We have Freedom of Information Act. We have libel law. We have a lot that, you know, uh, reporters' privileges that would protect you in a legal law lawsuit. Um, there's a lot that goes into, you know, understanding the ethics of journalism as well. And actually, I think that's one of the more important points to make is the fact that true journalists operate with um, what we call the elements of journalism. There's really nine aspects to the tenets that we should follow. And, you know, our obligation is to the citizen. It is to the truth. We're supposed to maintain independence from those we cover. So we don't cover our mom or our dad because we're not independent from them. Uh, we need to be able to provide the news in significant and interesting ways. We should be proportional and objective. We should be able to use our own personal conscience when reporting. But there are these tenets that really do hold true for professional journalists. Now, citizen journalists, by all means, there is a true awesomeness to it where sometimes they can be in places where mainstream media is not. They can bust out that you know, iPhone camera and get these protests that are happening live on the streets across the country. Um, they can see things. I mean, look at what we've seen in the past few months um, that was just simply captured by people who were there with their phones on. And um, sometimes news breaks in that way where they're the first on the scene and maybe they throw it up online and, and you know, the millions of views come in. But I will also say that citizen journalists in general are not held to the same standard that, you know, true journalists are. They're not held to the level of accuracy. Are all the facts transparent and verifiable? You know what I mean? The quality of sourcing or all your statistics timely, mm, yes. you know? And so there's a lot that goes into the difference between the two. And so what I would caution people 
is first of all, not everybody on the internet is actually a journalist. And then number two, once again, as a consumer of this media, just be very thoughtful that maybe that's just somebody's opinion or maybe they doctored up an image um, or changed a video and edited it in a way that was actually misconstruing the facts. So you just got to be, once again, more thoughtful about what you're digesting and taking in and ultimately seek out the best sources of content. So, you, you know, more trustworthy. Well, so talk a little bit about those sources of content. How can we make sure that we're finding you know, sources that we can trust where we know that the people that are writing and, and producing that content are living up to the standards. I love that question because it's a little bit hard to be like, oh, here's your top 10. <laughs> but um, what I could say just from my own personal, um, you know, I, I digest so much news and, you know, there are, there are some stellar reporters doing some amazing work. And I still do give major credit to the New York Times, even though on occasion it can get rather political and a little slanted. And we should be aware, you know, the billionaire that owns it, Halo, like obviously has some influence. But when you think about the NYT and the investigative reporting that's being done, it is truly remarkable. And the NYT usually does not jump the gun. It, it, it rarely actually jumps the gun without verified facts from multiple primary sources. And some of that stuff coming out is just remarkable. Michael Schmidt, you know, I mean, some of those reporters are, I mean, they deserve, they deserve Pulitzers. I mean, to be honest, if you really want to find some of the most notable reporters, why not look up who has won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative journalism for the past like 10 years? You know, when you get that list, I mean, it's, it's, it means those, people not only put themselves on the line to get the information, but they did a service to humanity in the work. And so, I mean, that would be a great way to go about finding some top drawer journalists. I am, you know, a fan of, um, it depends. I mean, Reuters has a decent reputation. The Associated Press, I do want to comment on the validity of that news organization. And honestly, it's probably one of my favorite are the journalists that produce work for the AP. Mm -hmm. The AP was forged in mid 1800s. Um, back then, it actually conjoined a bunch of news organizations to work together in order to transmit news over the telegraph, which back then cost a lot of money. And so they joined their resources. And then the, these groups of journalists ended up you know, coming up with tenets of how they would operate. They came up with the Associated Press style guide of how they should produce journalism and write it. Um, there's more than 3,000 journalists across the globe that work for the AP. So it's a very notable news organization. So that would be a worthy read. I'm a bit of a fan of like Al Jazeera, which, you know, we're getting into a little bit of liberal news out of the Middle East, but they tend to cut like straight down the line. They're, they're kind of a no nonsense NPR, which has a pretty good reputation for being pretty objective. So I could definitely suggest that. I think, you know, it depends on where you're at and your opinion of say CNN CNN under Trump administration has gotten the worst reputation as fake news. But to be honest, they're actually considered more of a moderate news organization. And they've seen some retooling in the past decade where they really, they swung very far to the right, shockingly, because Trump is so adverse to them. And, and CNN was very Republican for quite a while because they saw that Fox broadcast was kicking their butts. And so they <laughs> wanted to compete. And so they ended up swinging far to the right, but about, you know, I can't remember exactly how long, but several years ago, they decided to retool their news room and try to get back to center. And so they're working on it. Um, but CNN's not too bad. Wall Street Journal, even though shockingly, the Wall Street Journal is owned. Um, give me a second. I'm forgetting. Ooh, why am I forgetting who owns the Wall Street Journal? Is it, um, it'll come to me. But anyways, Wall Street Journal by nature would tend to be more conservative. It's all about the markets. But most people actually consider it a centrist publication. It's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, it's an excellent, I, I really like it. Yeah, I mean, I used to obviously read that every day when I was new, uh, reporting on the stock market. Um, um, if you swing far to the left, you're looking at stuff like New Yorker, 
some of the nightly shows, you know, like um, The Daily Show or Colbert, I mean, by all means, they're sitting more liberal. I would say if you're looking for really good sources of information, though, and let me talk about the web for a second, because most of us get our information off the internet. I think it's important to actually get a handle on who, once again, owns the website that you're going to, who literally owns the domain if you're going off to these like unusual little websites and figure out like, well, who's the ownership? And then therefore, what's the agenda? And then is this trustworthy? And by all means, you could go to the mainstream media, but also know that they're influenced as well by certain forces. Um, but to get a sense of where it, it sits on the political spectrum might help. Another comment is that it's helpful sometimes to get on international news. Um, there's a website called online newspapers with an S. Dot com and it'll lead you to most of the major publications around the world, even small little weeklies or, you know, in small little towns and you can read and, um, you know, just lift the veil. I think that's the goal. You know, lift the veil, start reading, start looking, dissect it, think about it. If you got questions about facts, go see if you can verify it in multiple primary sources. You know, and just get a little more academic about it. And don't believe everything you read or hear. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, Jennifer Mitchell, thank you so much for your uh, inside, brilliant insights, by the way. Um, yeah. Do you have any, like, closing thoughts to uh, leave with me? I, sure. I want to share that even in this time when journalism is kind of, you know, m there's a big distrust of journalists. It's really a true renaissance of this field. We are in a time where investigative reporting is so incredibly important and unfolding facts about what's going on with our leadership, especially in government. It's really remarkable what journalists do to put themselves on the line to get the stories. And when you think about the sacrifice and the work that goes into it, and frankly, I think most people don't think about it. They just simply click into an article, click to the next, you know, or get on the news network and watch that segment and then watch the next. And it's one of those like to literally sit in it for a few seconds and ask yourself, what did it take to get that? And the truth is these journalists are remarkable and the work they do is incredible. And this is truly a burgeoning time for this field because we've kind of never needed them so much. Um, some people might hearken back to Watergate era where information on Nixon, you know, the Pentagon files and Woodward and Bernstein, um, Woodward himself just did the interviews with Trump this year where he's breaking news. When you think about the stuff that journalists do, it is just, it's a commendable profession. It's a high calling. It should be respected and appreciated because to be honest, what would you really know if it weren't for journalists or great academics, you know, or, or fantastic book writers, but like mostly journalists, like what would you know? What would you know about the news? What would you know about what's going on in the country or the world? And so it's, it's truly a commendable field. Um, there's certainly a difference between, you know, good and bad journalism. And I think that we could talk about that. But it's one of those, you know, to not discredit an entire profession. And the truth is it deserves our appreciation because it um, liberates societies it can really shine light into dark places. And um, that's the place I think that we need to sit as journalists and also consumers of media. We should appreciate it. Well, thank you. You've actually made me uh, much more appreciative. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thanks easy. for having me on tonight. <laughs> it's easy to kind of get depressed about, you know, the state mm -hmm. of uh, news and journalism. But, uh, but after listening to you, I feel much more hopeful. Good. Good. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much, April. You're, you're a gem. That was such a great interview. You know, I think you could probably tell that Jenny has a deep and abiding love for journalism, but maybe not quite so much affection for many of those media outlets in which journalists ply their trade. 
Not all of them, of course. She did give us a decent list of sources that she considers legit. And she pretty much nailed it when she said, we are spending our lives in media. Boy, that's an eye-opening and powerful statement, especially since the vast majority of media consumers don't really have a clear idea of how the media works, except maybe you do now. The Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, while I found it a little overdramatic at times, really brings home the point that we are immersed in something that we don't fully understand. I don't know about you, but my iPhone tracks how much time I spend on social media, and I cringe every time I look at my usage hours. Trying to keep it down to a dull roar is challenging, I admit, especially these days when it's the major way we interact with our friends and family. But it's definitely something we all need to take a look at and decide if we're overdoing it. Another issue, of course, is these huge corporations that own the majority of media outlets. Jenny pointed out a few of them, and I've linked to several articles in the show notes that list the major media corporations, as well as the billionaires that own them. And I had to look up Carlos Slim Halu because I really wasn't aware of him before. But he's a Mexican billionaire who holds considerable power in his country. Uh, he owns a hefty percentage of the New York Times, and he's actually a fiscal conservative, which doesn't really mesh with the liberal nature of the Times. But in fact, in, uh, in these media conglomerates, it really isn't all that unusual. While there are some media billionaires that lean liberal, like Michael Bloomberg, although he's also been a registered Republican and an independent. Um, Jeff Bezos is considered to be more of a libertarian, but certainly there are media moguls who are conservatives like Carlos Slim, Sheldon Adelson, and Peter Till. Now, while some of those people have a say in what gets printed, others try to keep their hands off the editorial side. By the way, I had to look up the Bloomberg terminals because I'd never heard of them before. But I'm not a financial person, and they're used mostly by financial services corporations to get real-time access to market data. As Jenny said, you can pretty much find any piece of information by using those terminals. If it exists, Bloomberg has access to it. And that kind of information is power. So think for a moment what that kind of power those who can afford to access these terminals have. So these huge media corporations are also in the business of accruing information and power. And they do that by getting and keeping our attention so they can position their products in front of our eyeballs. They can, as Jenny says, shoot down certain stories, change the narrative, and control the optics. I think she was spot on when she talked about infotainment as replacing a lot of news reporting. That's the packaging of news to make it both more digestible and spinning it to fit a particular narrative. If you find an article interesting, maybe titillating, and it fits with your worldview, you're more likely to spend time reading it and maybe sharing and commenting on it. And the media outlet can then put advertising on yours and all your friends' pages that everyone will see. The more time you spend in one of these outlets, the more money some entity and, of course, some person is going to make. Many media outlets will do whatever it takes to drive up viewership and ratings. And often, the more sensational, the better. And we are all the worse for it. I put a link in the show notes from the Digital Resource Center. That's a news literacy source. And it explains the difference between hard news and opinion. While both are important and serve a purpose, a good media consumer knows the difference. A straight news story gives information and explains what happened. An op-ed piece, however, takes that same information and interprets it through the particular viewpoint of the author. And again, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you know the difference. There's also a link in the show notes to the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. That spells out the high standards that professional journalists have to follow. The idea of journalism as a high calling is one that, as Jenny attests, is worth doing. There's also a link to the APA's principles that all professional journalists are expected to abide by. The first principle is a journalist's first obligation is to the truth. 
The second principle is, a journalist's first loyalty is to the citizens, not to a viewpoint, not to a corporation, not to a billionaire, not to a politician, obliged to the truth and loyal to the citizens. That's a powerful responsibility. And knowing that there are a lot of people out there who call themselves journalists, but who either through ignorance or intention do not abide by these principles is disturbing. There's something that we didn't touch on in the interview that I think is definitely an issue. Now, this is when well-meaning journalists try to avoid the appearance of bias by reporting both sides of an issue without explaining that one of those sides is much more likely to be based on correct information than the other side. This creates a situation called false balance. And rather than inform the public, it can actually confuse them, causing them to doubt whether anything is true, which is honestly the last thing that any ethical journalist should be doing. If there's a preponderance of good, solid evidence on one side, that should also be part of the discussion, and providing that information does not turn a straight news story into an opinion piece. Of course, that journalist has to show their sources and evidence so that the readers can look at everything. Two mutually opposed sides do not always have equal merit. That having been said, I'm happy to see that many good ethical journalists are taking this to heart and explaining that the evidence supports a particular side and then sourcing that evidence. I'm going to link to a great episode of the Lawfare podcast, which I've mentioned before in earlier episodes. It explains that while social media gets a lot of the blame for disinformation, it's actually more likely to begin in mainstream and cable news outlets. That means that the large percentage of our population that gets its news mostly from local, national, and cable news, which you might be surprised to know is about 30% of the population, they end up as confused and frustrated people that might decide to stay away from politics and even decide not to vote. I also added a link to the Pulitzer organization so you can look up the winners in case you want to follow some great journalists. I agree with Jenny when she says we have never needed good journalism as much as we do now. To quote her, without them, what would we really know? Don't forget to check out all the links in the show notes. And I'll see you in episode seven.